Welcome to APEC. It's May 1st and I'm your moderator, Tim Ventura. First, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us on this call along with everyone watching us on YouTube. In today's session, Tom Vallone will present a review of electrogravitics and electrokinetic propulsion. Glenn Robertson is going to discuss quantum gravity as a quantum warp field. And Mike Gamble will be presenting part two of a study of the Earth's gravitational system. After that, we'll catch up with the latest research from the Falcon Space Team, and we'll be wrapping up the event with open discussion and ad hoc presentations. So just a couple of quick reminders. You can view conference replays, details, and speaker info on our website at www.altpropulsion.com. And uh, please save your questions for the Q&A session after each speaker's presentation. Uh, go ahead and type those questions into chat. We will scan through the chat and try and call on you after each presenter finishes. So I am very pleased to introduce our first guest, someone who's been with us before, but it is wonderful to have him back doing a full presentation. Tom Vallone is the president of the Integrity Research Institute, as well as the editor of the well-respected Future Energy newsletter. He's authored six books, edited over 10 books, and written over 100 scientific studies, articles, and papers related to energy propulsion and bioenergetics in many different forms. He provides consultations on electrical product design and development, as well as engineering testing and uh, many other things, including expert testimony and opinion. He meets regularly with congressional and Senate leaders and briefs them on latest energy developments. And his views regarding energy related matters have been featured on national media, including CNN, Discovery, A&E, History Channel, and many more. So Dr. Vallone has been a patent examiner for the US Patent and Trademark Office and holds a PhD in general engineering from Kennedy Western University, an MA in physics from SUNY at Buffalo, a BS in physics and a BS in electrical engineering from SUNY at Buffalo. And he is a licensed professional engineer with the state of New York. So Tom, welcome, sir. Let me, let me unmute you and then I will hand it right over to you. Okay, and uh, Tom, you're still muted, sir. Oh, sorry, uh, Tom. Thank you. Now I got it. Sorry, <laughs> that, yeah, I was unmuted before, and somebody. Did a no, that was me. Uh, my apologies, sir. Um. I'm also interested in recording just my session, but you have to give me permission, apparently. Uh, yes. Um. So I'll wait just a second for the host to take control. Allow to record multi, there, there we go. Okay, I'll do it again. Great. Well, I'm Tom Vallone from Integrity Research Institute, and I'm happy to share this updated um, slideshow on electrogravitics, electrokinetics, and basically propellantless propulsion. Uh, this was actually a slideshow given at the um, AIA uh, conference, and I think I should share my screen. That would probably be a nice thing for everybody. And so let's see if I can actually do that as well. Yeah, there we go. Okay. And you can see the title of the slide. And I even have a little cursor too, I'm gonna to point at stuff. So this slideshow was given at the um, AIA proceedings in 2008 and also the University of Maryland uh, 2012. And, um, and also it was uh, basically um, uh, presented in, in written form in a few different journals as well. So um, uh, without further ado, Let's see if I can forward this using my arrows. There we go. So the uh, publication in 2012 um, is on sciencedirect.com, in case you're interested. That's uh, open access um, proceedings. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it was done for a SPECIF, the Space Propulsion Energy Sciences International Forum. And I have to give credit to uh, Glenn Robertson, who well, I really did an excellent job for years in hosting that competition to state, <laughs> which uh, Spisa certainly was. And 
the fact that we got into an Elsevier publication afterwards, uh, I thought was very impressive. So um, kudos to uh, Glenn Robinson, <clears throat> who's also with us today. And then in 2015, I was able to um, produce a review of the um, updated electrogenetics, electrokinetics, which you'll see today. And the uh, Journal of uh, Geosciences is doing a special one on gravity. So I felt uh, compelled to participate. And actually, it was amazing that uh, uh, this article has had the largest downloads and views that the journal has ever had. So I get about once a month the uh, interest and uh, invitation to come back and give them some more good stuff, um, which hopefully someday I will. <laughs> Excuse me. So yeah, as you can see, it's uh, scirp.org um, is the uh, open access paper uh, as well for this um, topic. And then also it was interesting that um, Takashi Amusha from uh, Japan and uh, Pinero uh, basically uh, invited me to be part of their Nova Publishers uh, hardcover. And this was a very interesting collection of papers. I did the intro and also uh, one further down on uh, gravity uh, and electrolytics as well. And it's a hardcover book, um, nicely bound, and certainly a collector's item. So in starting with the history of electrogravitics, um, we have to give credit for the 1918 Professor Nieper in Electrical Experimenter uh, first describing this possibility of um, electricity having an effect on propulsion. So electrogravitics is um, hard to define because we're not showing uh, or demonstrating a clear in interference or effect on the gravitational field per se. So um, uh, in general, most of the slideshow and most of the patents by Thomson Brown uh, basically deal with electrokinetics. And I have an interesting story to tell you about electrokinetics, the actual phrase that he uses. So in the 1920s, Thomson Brown finds that a Coolidge tube exhibits a thrust when uh, turned on. And this would be um, uh, basically the uh, effect that uh, was uh, an impetus for Thomson Brown to be involved in further experiments. And so in 1928, he got his first patent, the British uh, 300 311. And uh, this is still an interesting uh, first attempt at talking about gravitators. So the whole patent is very fascinating. I reproduced the entire thing um, in the first volume, which you see at the bottom here on the left, electrogravitic systems. This was redone um, a few years back when uh, Paula Violet pulled the B-52 uh, article and put it in his book, which I'll show you in a second. But it still contains lots of great historical stuff, including the two aviation studies reports, which really form the basis for this phrase electrogravitics, because that's what they used as, in the title of the report. Um, but in between here, we see this very intriguing article in Science and Invention, How I Control Gravitation. And that's reproduced in the second volume, Electrogravitics 2. Uh, because basically, I feel that we finally figured out how Townsend Brown controlled gravity, even though he didn't know at the time and kept expressing that problem that he had in uh, understanding the effects that he was measuring. So. Um, I invite you to visit the website, thomastownsandbrown.com. Um, it's an amazing collection, first of all, of all his patents, which is exciting, and, um, and, and basically lots of other good stuff that, that you can also see from uh, historical information. So to show you just a couple pages worth of what electrogravitic systems entailed in 1956, this was obtained through an inter interlibrary loan. Um, it's been a few years now. Uh, when when I worked on the, the project, which was retyping, uh, typesetting the original report that I found um, in a very obscure source, uh, Paula Violet actually, I think, found this one from Wright Patterson Air Force Base uh, through interlibrary loan. So this is also um, uh, interesting because it also had I think it was on the left side here, the title page, the word confidential um, for many years. 
And the title here basically is Electrolytic Systems, Examination of Electrostatic Motion, Dynamic Counterberry, which is a great uh, tongue twister, and very centric control. Uh, so this uh, aviation studies limited is still in existence and in business in London. Uh, we've contacted them, found that they were no longer interested in this topic, but they acknowledge the fact that they had published it. So it's not something obscure or uh, disavowed. <clears throat> and just one little segment of the intro from the report gives you a flavor for what this, um, I would say excitement was all about back in the 50s, uh, 1956. And there were two reports, one in the spring, one in the fall. And what we see here is that uh, Towns of Brown thought to improve upon various proposals for electrostatic motors, uh, which you see in one of his patents. The rigs they're talking about are these um, uh, carousels, merry-go-rounds that uh, he worked on, you'll see in the picture in a second. And the rotating around the central tower, uh, input down the arms, basically a tip. But the massive K or dielectric constant was essentially talked about a lot and in 1952 or 56, there basically was a problem in obtaining anything that had sufficient 5,000 or higher dielectric constant. Um, so uh, what you see is the proposal later on in the report of a saucer um, having this um, supersonic ability. And, and that was their goal. And all the um, aeronautics companies at that time, it wasn't aerospace, it was just aeronautics companies, uh, Lockheed and uh, Lear and so forth. They were all in, in into this project. They all had their own uh, R&D uh, uh, feet in the fire to, to uh, compete with each other to see who could maximize the effects. Uh, but in the meantime, in a few years uh, from there, 1960, we see Brown and Bonson having their own lab um, and, and developing a dozen patents or more on what they called electrokinetics. And this patent 2958790 shows you how complex some of the uh, surfaces, three different uh, domes, uh, lots of information, uh, intriguing onboard high voltage uh, generators and so forth. <clears throat> and some of these um, uh, reports that were not able to be put in the book, but um, were uh, collected into uh, other reports is, first of all, the um, uh, color booklet that's available on Amazon, T. Towns of Brown's Electrolytics Research, which has some of the uh, latest photos, um, thanks and credit to um, Paula Violet from obtaining them from France, and also some of the uh, Towns of Brown lab uh, video stills, uh, as well as quite a few other things that are, are worth uh, looking at. And this, this sells very well. In fact, uh, the, the Project Monk, uh, Monk Gulfier is uh, probably the source of the interest in that. But I also call your attention to this interesting report by the military in 1952. And this is exactly what they call it, a special inquiry um, dealing with Townsend Brown, the electrogravity device of Townsend Brown. And that's also available on Amazon. Well, uh, quoting from that report, um, what we find is, I find it humorous, uh, I'm sorry, but <laughs> to see the military get upset and angry or, or <laughs> unscrewed, uh, I think is exciting. So, okay, here's the quote. Um, basically, ONR, uh, Office of Naval Research, called it an electrogravity device, and that's where the title comes from. This is the device they're talking about, one that he uh, eventually did patent. But in the meantime, uh, in talking to Admiral Arthur Radford, who later became Joint Chiefs of Staff for President Eisenhower and General Petraeus. Basically, the um, Admiral was frightened that a flying saucer test were being done by a private group in 1952. So yes, we got to take it out of their hands and put it in the safe uh, deposit box of ONR. And now we move on to the present day. And essentially the um, work here basically is credited to Paula Violet again. And this I found very intriguing. And even to this day, it seems still valid and viable. Um, has, does the B2 have classified technology? Well, interestingly enough, 
even people that have worked on the B2 don't know about the classified uh, high voltage um, uh, propulsion possibilities, even though they acknowledge all the different components that are involved. So what you see in the 1994 photo of the B2 was the visible uh, layer of the uranium oxide dielectric, which had the high dielectric constant that was desirable back in the 50s. And Paul drew this very interesting diagram of the uh, charge flowing uh, from the flame jet generator out the back and the high voltage uh, from the front. Well, the modern day photo doesn't show any uh, color difference between the leading edge high voltage and the rest of the craft. Uh, uh, Tom, I'm sorry, if I could jump in real quick. Um, your voice is a little faint. Is there a way that you could get a little closer to your mic? Oh, of course. And I'm, I'm terribly I'm sorry for the, interrupting. Okay, yeah, I'm using the camera mic. Um, so is that any better if I'm a little bit closer there? Yeah, it, that's that's a little bit better. Thank okay. you, sir. Sure. Um, so what I wanted to, to share with you is um, um, a little um, anecdote that happened to me since I knew a couple of people at the Department of Energy. Well, uh, essentially the uh, question was, um, is this high voltage um, uh, design that you see up here from one of uh, Brown's patents uh, and, and enhanced by Paul to explain where the negative charges come from. The uh, question is, does this propulsion system even uh, have any evidence? Well, I had a friend that actually lives out um, in, in the eastern uh, country area, east of Washington, D.C., and he works for DOE, so he'd keep in touch with anything of, of interest in the new energy area. Well, one night he was outside and he saw a B-2 fly overhead toward um, uh, one of the Air Force bases nearby. And he said since it was at night, he could actually see the uh, blue glow on the leading edge of the wings. <laughs> So I said, yep, there we go, <laughs> leading edge ionizer. Um, and what we find uh, as we move along here is that there's two explanations for it. One is that this um, uh, charge flow does obey Townsend Brown's uh, discovery that this will produce a, a, an ion effect of, of propulsion. And, and also there's an effect on laminating the airflow as well. So this is... Uh, a two, twofold uh, benefit. <clears throat> but it was great to get an eyewitness and that, that we reproduced that story in the, um, one of the electrolytic books. So here we see the diagrams that Paul developed and are now reprinted in his book, Secrets of Anti-Gravity Propulsion. I highly recommend this book. It's a very uh, great compilation of some of the most uh, intriguing and classified, some of the classified information, um, especially when you deal with UFO propulsion, um, various multi-layer uh, artifacts that seem to have electrolytic uh, capability, um, all of that is in the book. And, um, and, and of course, some of these diagrams dealing with the B2 as well. So it's a great source of uh, information and research. Now, in, in this slide, what we see is that um, the Air Force Research Lab, which is, uh, I find, a very intriguing laboratory um, because basically they tend to have classified and unclassified um, research projects. The um, fact is that they probably developed this electrovitics years before, but the unclassified part of the lab didn't know about it, didn't have need to know. And so here they are in 2003 reinventing the uh, high voltage laminar flow discovery, which was kind of ironic, but it was nice to see that at least it's in the public domain. So you can visibly see the difference. With zero voltage, you can visibly see the turbulence from probably a little bit of smoke that they're introducing to make it visible on a, on a wing uh, simulator in a, in a, a wind funnel. And then at 17,000 volts, um, what we see is a very laminar flow of air over the wing. So it reduces drags, uh, creates laminar flow. And that, as I say, is one of the benefits of, uh, of having a high voltage applied to the, um, to the craft. So here we try to um, separate in some degree 
<clears throat> the uh, electrokinetics from electrogravitics, but uh, they sort of overlap. And basically, uh, I think electrokinetics is a more generalized uh, phrase to be using when we're talking about this uh, type of uh, uh, phenomenon. So Beifeld is the university professor who really helped Townsend Brown along with his experiments. And then Project Winterhaven was the um, focus of attention by the military uh, in 1952, and also the Aviation Studies Report. And then we see 60 to 65, and lots of Brown patents being developed, and Bonson got involved as well. And then by 2004, even NASA got involved as well. And we'll show you some of those uh, uh, patent uh, covers as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. The uh, discoveries basically can be summarized in, I would say, a few different parts. Uh, part one might be the uh, early 1957 filing of electrokinetic apparatus that Brown developed. And here you see the positive uh, charge on the leading edge and the um, laminar flow going out the back. The basic idea that he developed was to have a wire suspended by an insulator um, as, as the leading edge part of it. And Larry Davenport actually developed and built one of these um, the carousels in Mary, Mary Gallant. So it worked pretty well. There's a YouTube video that shows him uh, demonstrating it. And I was uh, fortunate enough to uh, buy one of his um, uh, small tabletop devices from him. So the greatest forces on the capacitor, if the small electrode is positive, the effect occurs in a dielectric medium, which is air, and can be used for vehicle propulsion or even to pump a dielectric fluid. <clears throat> and here we see the uh, part two, I would say, would be the electrokinetic transducer. And this was a uh, patent uh, 3018394. And it basically has the same images as the first one that we uh, described. And the, um, the important part is that we're uh, also discovering that the dielectric medium is uh, moved relative to the pairs of electrodes. Um, and, and this external mechanical force is the intriguing part of the scientific in investigation. And a variation on the potential uh, results in a, a variation of the force. So that's a good confirmation that there are two, uh, the two are co correlated. <clears throat> the uh, third part here, I would say, would be the further patent of 187206. And this is where he starts shaping the leading edge to um, propel the device through the surroundings and essentially provide the electrostatic field, field gradient, uh, which in this case would be more nonlinear. And, um, and then there's lots of considerations for permittivity and permeability and so forth. <clears throat> well, uh, here the Office of Naval Research um, provides a, a tremendous uh, insight into the, um, the work that um, they had done in experimenting with the voltage versus propulsion. Propulsion is on, a, this is a log log graph, and we're looking at propulsion efficiency in percentage on the left side um, coordinate and the kilovolts um, in the uh, x axis on the right side here. And then disk speed is also. Um, graphed on the right. So it's a three-prong attack on the different uh, information that, we're, that they're providing. Well, the important part, I thought, was the disk speed, which is lower B, and the uh, voltage, which it turns out they've measured uh, fifth power dependence. So that's pretty incredible that um, uh, fifth power would, would actually be um, uh, related to the velocity. So as we increase the voltage a little bit, we're getting a lot more bang for our buck, apparently. And the efficiency goes up as well as we obviously, you know, that graph is also going upwards too. So what I found um, recently was that the Army Research Lab had also done some work and I was able to um, obtain the force on an asymmetric capacitor that uh, Bather and Fazzi produced from the Air Force uh, Research Lab, which was here in College Park, actually in Maryland. And their um, uh, discernment in the various uh, analysis, which you'll see uh, 
coming up here is that ion mobility was basically the source of the force uh, that Townsend Brown had developed. And they're talking about a one pound per kilowatt or five newtons per kilowatt uh, reducing shift. And here are some of the uh, flyers that they started with. And you'll recognize them probably from Tim Ventura's original uh, investigations and videos that he used to provide. Um, they don't like the triangular one that, that Tim's famous for, um, calling it the not a vigorous flyer. But for this relatively the same voltage, their uh, square device actually seemed to hover very vigorously. So um, uh, their reports are reproduced in the second volume of Electrolytics, the second book. <clears throat> and the um, uh, further uh, wing shaped asymmetric capacitor, which is sort of a, a flat um, uh, surface design, uh, actually they claim was best, even though the current was quite high, uh, got a half an amp here. Uh, but the force on the capacitor greatly exceeded its weight, and that's, of course, what they're excited about. Um, but uh, imagining the, the 38 gauge wire they had to deal with is uh, pretty unusual too. But that's the uh, apparently the ratio that seems to uh, relate to the best force that they can produce. So, so here's the analysis that the um, Air Force Research Lab uh, went through to try to figure out what's causing the force. Uh, the proposed explanation for it initially was ion, ionic wind. And you see that in various uh, assessments of uh, Hans and Brown. Oh, it's just ion wind, you know. And, uh, and yet it works in a vacuum. So th that's the surprise that we found uh, Hans and Brown was able to provide. So the first step is uh, what do we uh, find from analyzing the ion wind um, hypothesis? Well, taking kinetic energy, relating it to the force uh, on a charge. Basically, then the force is exerted on the capacitor through the current flowing through the capacitor gap, um, through the ions, obviously. And then solving um, the first equation using two to get the upper limit on the force. Basically, then we're um, looking at the uh, mass, F equals mg, um, Newton's law, and then the mass of the ion wind basically uh, lifting, uh, how much could it lift if the ion wind was due just to the electrons? And you get uh, very small, uh, almost micrograms of force, less than a microgram. And if the ion wind is due to copper ions coming off from the wire, then we've at least got milligrams. But still, you can't even lift the three to five grams that the flyer uh, consists of. So they move on to part B. And in part B, we're looking at electron drift as a possible one. And so their analysis is that the wire is 2,500 times, um, the electric field, in other words, is 2,500 times larger than the rounded electrode. And you guys probably know the fact that uh, as you go to a point, you can concentrate an electric field tremendously. And that's the, um, uh, basis for this analysis. So the smaller we make the radius of the wire, uh, the more intense the field can be uh, uh, from the wire. And then the foil, foil electrode radius is used. Um, we're looking at the electric field ratio, which is around um, 10 to the seventh volts per meter. And there's also um, a footnote here dealing with the other net force on asymmetric capacitors and drift transport that um, people can research if they're interested. <coughs> Excuse me. Hmm. So for a vacuum capacitor, the net force is some of the uh, surface integrals over each electrode. And we're looking at the electron mobility. Uh, this is a fixed constant. And if it's nitrogen ions or oxygen ions, it's around 2.5 instead of 670. <clears throat> Obviously, because it's a little bit heavier, <laughs> quite a bit heavier. And so the net force due to electron mobility is still in the millinewton range. Um, 
and if it's uh, lift due to drift of electrons, we're still in the uh, small uh, milligram range. So this uh, ion mobility idea uh, didn't seem to carry a lot of weight. And in fact, this was electron drift that we're talking about. So uh, now we're going And, and to Tom, again, I I'm sorry, you're, you're fading out a little bit. So again, if, if you could just try and speak up a little bit more, you're, you're getting faint. Okay. But my apologies. <clears throat> yeah, I'm trying my best. <laughs> So um, the negative uh, ion drift with ion mobility is the uh, final stage of their uh, analysis. And what's interesting about this is now we get into uh, force due to nitrogen ions or oxygen ions in the air. And we're already at a, a tenth of a Newton. And then the mass lift due to mobility of nitrogen ions, which is basically the correct order of magnitude um, about 16 grams. So their conclusion is that ion mobility is the appropriate quantity for derivation of a static lethal brown conductive kinetic force. And the force scales inversely with ion mobility. So this is also important because uh, electrons apparently are not contributing to the force as much as uh, negative ions are. <clears throat> and here we have a famous image which you've seen from years ago, um, where the Tim Ventura Skyhook lifter is uh, taking off, and American Anti Gravity was the uh, source of inspiration worldwide for it. And I believe we have a video too that we can show you with this thing actually flying around. There it goes, off to Mars, yay! <laughs> I, I can jump in, I guess, because that's my video. Tom stepped away. So that's a uh, that's a three foot lifter. Actually, that was back when I lived in Seattle. Uh, it doesn't look like there's any interior cells on that, but there may be. Uh, that was on my back porch. Um, the, the three foot one lifted very well. A, a lot of it was kind of related to how much the power supply could output. Um, the, the largest, the, the largest that I built was nine feet. The largest that flew well was four feet. So you had a four foot lifter as well. It was at this one. Yeah, yeah, that was that was the four foot lifter. I actually built uh, two or three different versions of that. They all pretty much looked identical. I don't know if you can tell them apart by looking. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. So what I was using was um, I was using a fifty kilovolt. I don't remember what the um, I don't remember what the output was, but it, it was a fifty kilovolt power supply from Information Unlimited, and mm -hmm. uh, I bypassed the output voltage regulator on it. What that did was it let the voltage float. The lifter itself is basically a resistor. And so it let the lifter determine its own voltage. Uh, we did a bunch of measurements on it. I think it preferred or something around 30 kilovolts. Um, but I, I found that it did vary a little bit depending on you know temperature, humidity, air pressure, all, all that kind of stuff. So again, that's, that's another three foot ones. But I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Tom. Yeah, no, that's great. I, uh, I wanted a soundtrack for it as well. <laughs> so, um, but in general, there's a wire somewhere suspended above it. Two you, wires. Yeah, so actually, um, the, basically, what you can't see in those, especially with that resolution, that was for, for that time, that was high res for digital video. But right. um, so there are three pieces of sewing thread, just regular black sewing thread that I would tie it down with. Typically, I would make those four to six feet. Um, and I would tie them around the posts, the corners, and then just run them down to pieces of tape on the deck. Um, I, I ended up using duct tape. Actually, when the, when the lifter comes up, it comes up with enough force that it can break the thread or break the wires. So sometimes, yeah, I would use fishing line, but... So we would tie it down. A lot of people back then, right, when we were doing headlines and stuff, a lot of people would accuse us of lifting it up, which I always thought was funny because we weren't tying it up. We were tying it down, right? 
And, and the reason was, you can see in that one, um, there are a couple of wires there. Uh, that was just copper magnet wire from Radio Shack. So nothing special. It leaked like crazy. It did have a coating on it, but it did leak like crazy. Um, I would suspend those from the side and let them drape. So if, if you put them above the lifter, it can cause problems. It can hit your Corona wire and stuff like that. So kind of suspending them from the side and letting them drape. And then you give them enough slack that it can go up. You know, typically I would run these things four to six feet off the ground. I think the highest I ever had one go was eight or nine feet. And, and after that, you run into issues, just lots of issues, just maintaining stability with it. Um, then I think the other thing that I, it might be worth noting is... Um, we, we played with lots of different Corona wire. Bob Iannini gave me 50 gauge stainless steel Corona wire. And wow. we found that that worked better than anything else, partly because of the very fine gauge that helped. Um, I also noticed that when you're using copper Corona wire, it has some kind of a chemical reaction with the air and it's noisy as heck and it gives off more of a glow and there's all sorts of issues with it. So the stainless steel wire, it seemed like the ions would come right off that. The charge, the charge flow was really smooth. We didn't have any, any real issues. Interesting. And plus it wouldn't corrode, which is also a very nice benefit as well. No, no oxidation to reduce the conductivity. <clears throat> That's great, thanks, Tim. Oh, sure thing. So as we move on to the recent developments, um, we see Serrano, Woodward, and Campbell, uh, Campbell's from NASA, uh, contributing to this science uh, more substantially. And Campbell's patent here is the 775-123 that we're referring to having the same design as Townsend Brown, but more with the um, uh, positive uh, charge plate rather than a wire. Um, so that's the slight difference. And Serrano seemed to like the idea of multi-stages, uh, whether or not that uh, functioned very well. I haven't seen a report on Serrano's work to verify that. <clears throat> but we see from Woodward's uh, work, his results were very small and also has a very unusual uh, piezoelectric uh, device that's uh, involved as well. So here we see John Lee and Dan's uh, attempt to replicate um, Campbell's patent uh, with a, a surface uh, electrode, a flat surface electrode, and then the uh, negatively charged uh, base. And you can see the little GIF up in the corner. And what we see in the graph here, which I just inserted recently to give you some of the data that he produced, um, is the linear speed goes upwards on the y-axis, and the uh, time basically is on the x-axis. So apparently the um, device seems to increase over a period of 8,000 seconds uh, until it finally levels off in its uh, speed. So it's basically providing a pretty um, interesting acceleration, a constant acceleration up to a point. And so this is available at his website, uh, jlnlabs.org. And I've got to give you know, then a lot of credit to every single device we've ever heard of or even wondered if it works, he'll go ahead and build it and test it and publish it. So his website is very good for information like this. And here we see another um, the patent that I'm uh, referring to as well, 317310, um, having the same design but a different patent uh, that was awarded, same structure in other words, and this is from 2001 hollow cylinder um, or a solid cylinder, basically is what he's describing. So NASA must have felt that this had uh, some useful and viable uh, applications in their work, and particularly for space, which also gives more credibility to Brown's uh, discovery that it works in a vacuum. Uh, Woodward is a professor at um, California State University. I've talked to him personally. Um, he basically is funded to do this work, and yet the production and the results seem to be very minuscule. Uh, Micronewtons, in other words, is what he's producing, even uh, with substantial voltage and uh, high, high uh, frequency as well. 
So uh, the voltage is up to around 600 volts. Um, basically, he's expanding and contracting the distances between the masses, positively, negatively charged. So it, there's a lot of questions about whether or not he's influencing inertia. And that's his basic claim, is that he can modify inertia by this uh, action. <clears throat> well, one of the interesting developments in producing the second volume of electrogravitics was uh, essentially to look at all the unresolved uh, electrogravitic uh, experiments that I had witnessed for decades prior to this. Um, really, we're, we're talking about the, uh, uh, the two volumes of work that I put together. The two volumes of work basically were the uh, Electrovitics 1 and 2. Uh, Electrovitics 1 came out in 1994, and Electrovitics 2, I'm looking at it uh, right now, 2004. So they're about 10 years apart. And what I found in 2004 was I really wanted to provide an introduction that would summarize the, um, the work of these uh, scientists, including Rudolf Zinser. Rudolf Zinser produced this very unusual uh, arrangement of two uh, electrodes in water that essentially were put on uh, a balance beam, which I'll show you in a second here. And he produced six newtons per watt not per kilowatt like the AFL was doing, but uh, six newtons per watt. And at the time I was very intrigued because even the inertial propulsion devices like Mike Campbell's gonna talk about um, are, are better than what the DC-9 jet at the time was producing, which I was able to find the numbers for. Uh, the the DC-9 um, uh, airplane is, is essentially producing a millinewtons per watt. 16 millinewtons per watt. So it's amazing that, that, that all of these devices uh, surpass what commercially is available uh, at even perhaps even today. So here we go. The, the Zinsser device uses a patented sawtooth pulse generator. Uh, I saw him in 1980 in Germany, and he also presented at the um, uh, Non-Conventional Energy Technology Conference in 1981 in Toronto. And these are quarter wavelength uh, electrodes at 100 kilohertz. And even George Hathaway became involved in the work. This report's available on Amazon. It's basically a book and eventually might be published as a book. Uh, right now, it's a staple report. And what we see is his instrument sawtooth generator here. These are photographs supplied by him. I was one of his best fans, so he sent me all these color images and data and information on what he did. And here's the balance beam. There's the transducer, and when he turns it on, it basically unbalances everything, and you can see a, a vertical force from this. And the whole basis of this was that it was unexplained. Uh, it's almost like William Shatner's show on the unexplained, it disqualified for that. Um, and, and it had this very interesting characteristic, just like Townsend Brown reports in how he control gravitation, then when he turns it on, the force increases. When he turns it off, it slowly decreases. So there wasn't much of a storage effect. And, um, and, and here he's talking about micronewtons that he measured, but the wattage that went in was very small. So what I'm getting to is the fact that um, I was perplexed by all of these experiments, Townsend Brown's finding that the best force was when he turned it on and also sensors having a similar effect. Well, I looked up on the shelf and saw Jeff Menkel's book, Causality, Electromagnetic Induction Gravitation. I thought, well, maybe Jeff Menkel's got something. He's a professor, West Virginia University. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get his electrostatic motors book from him to reproduce before he passed away. So we're happy to keep that in print. Um, he was a genius, really. And he also uh, explored atmospheric electricity better than anybody else, I would say. Um, so the important part here, though, is Jeff Menko's understanding of what he called the electrokinetic equation. And so I even wrote to him when I found this book and started reading it, I said, did you know that Townsend Brown also used the same phrase and has a, a phenomenon that seems to uh, have the same mirrored effect that your equation's describing? And he said, no, I never heard of him. <laughs> So here's two parallel geniuses developing the same thing, calling it the same thing, and yet basically 
they never met, never knew each other, never corresponded. Um, so what we find here is the big insight I'm talking about, parallel plates, um, you've got X distance and W for the uh, thick width of the plates, AC power, and here's Jeff Menko's equation for that, X over W and DI DT. Now the important part is this is a reverse electric field will produce a backward force and it's relying upon DI DT. So the important part here is the faster the current surges into those plates, the more force you're gonna get. He likes to use the electrokinetic field, um, but you essentially can look at it in terms of the uh, force and uh, change in momentum. The equation up at the top and the right also helps explain in terms of vector potential. Um, and then there's various forms of integration as well. So this was the insight that I found. I was very excited about it. I still am today. And I basically give him um, all the credit to discovering and explaining theoretically with lots of examples in the book of how this uh, electrokinetic effect can actually rely upon a surging pulsed current. And to me, this is the biggest insight, fully explains Zinsser's effect, even the polarity of it, the, the force on those uh, parallel plates that we saw in water, uh, essentially is going in the opposite direction of the um, electric field that's being induced. And so I'm summarizing the effect that Jeff Menko discovered right here, a fast pulse current with short rise time will produce the largest force on any length element uh, dl over r and it's a basically a minus sign <clears throat> so here's the book the cover it's still in print um the uh, company actually i think it's on amazon as well uh, we also sell it integrity research has it on our website since we're able to get it from the publisher and uh, essentially it is um, a spin-off from his uh, textbook on electromagnetic fields. He taught uh, e &M for years at the university, um, but he then uh, extrapolated to the electrokinetic effect uh, in this book. And also um, Paul Murad loves his uh, co-gravitational effect that's also in the second half of the book. So this diagram kind of summarizes, you get two for the price of one in this book. You got gravitational stuff and this amazing electrokinetic uh, information. So one of the uh, suggestions I make is that even the Schleicher patent um, with the pulsed rise times here might be the type of force um, uh, waveform that would optimize the electrokinetic uh, results. And now let's go back to Townsend Brown, who is our hero and the main focus of our um, investigation. And what we see in his report, How I Control Gravity, 1929, which is, as I say, reproduced in the second volume, um, we see Brown reporting the fact that he's looking at the 120 volts that he's supplying to uh, 44 pound suspended weights with a glass rod insulator in between. And um, essentially, we're looking at the direction of movement of the entire system toward the positive. However, the voltage that he's supplying and the current would be going the opposite direction. And what he reports also with this uh, portion uh, balance as well, is that you've got current going uh, in one direction and the um, movement going in the opposite direction. Current going backwards, force going forward toward the positive. And what Brown reports in print in this article repeat, repeatedly is that I kept the voltage on, I expected it to stay suspended in the direction that it was going, but it didn't. It only moved when I turned the thing on. And he basically is at a conundrum, uh, expresses his frustration that he can't figure out why the electrokinetic force is, is so momentary. Well, now we know from uh, Jeff Menko's uh, discovery that this is a, to be expected as the surge of uh, current goes into the electrodes, that's the only time the force is uh, exerted. And I think we might actually have an insight into the Searle effect 
Um, essentially, what you see in these uh, levitating craft is the little, um, he basically had levers all the way around, but only uh, turned on, I would say, a third of them. Approximately a third were opened to create a break in the voltage. And you have to imagine if, if Searle was possibly uh, credible in producing high voltage from the center to the outer edge, that by interrupting the voltage distribution at one side only, he basically could create this um, separation of charge that uh, essentially would obey the, the uh, Townsend Brown um, effect, uh, the E field Brown effect of electrokinetics, where one side would be more positive than the other. And so maybe the Searle effect is also uh, to be contributed and, and credited back to the Townsend Brown uh, discovery and the Jeff Menko discovery. Maybe. <clears throat> well, one more report that we see from uh, Takaki Musha from Honda Corporation is his uh, experiment and derivation of another uh, coupling he claims between electricity and gravity, which he called obviously electrolytics as well. And the, I would say the uh, 1929 paper talks about the fact that closer capacitor plates are important, higher capacitance of dielectric is important, the area, the voltage, and mass between the plates. All these contribute to the electrolytic effect. Well, Musha does a little derivation here and then shows you his experiments. And we basically are looking at a generalized Lorentz force, um, which he uh, adds the electrolytic and what he calls magnetogravitic effect, which may relate to what Dr. Ming Li was also uh, proposing. And when he uh, basically then adds them, uh, talks about a static atom being force free like a superconductor um, inside the charged particle uh, with an external electric field. And then induce, introducing electrogravitic potential, which is this phi uh, sub G, he then goes through his boundary conditions and a displacement of charge to come up with what uh, he describes as a displacement of the atom itself. Um, this is I, I find an unusual analysis, but intriguing in some regards. So his diagrams, which are also reproduced, uh, show the displacement of electrons around the nucleus becoming slightly displaced in the presence of high voltage, which is feasible and understandable and probably uh, realistic. So to further his derivation, he comes up with the electrogravitic force from displaced electrons around the nucleus, uh, simplified with an R0 approximation for electron radius. And then assuming that the electron radius is bigger than the displacement, which I find a big assumption, who knows whether it is or not. Um, we basically come down to the domain length where the new electrogravitic force uh, generated is in 10 to the minus 22 meters which is basically smaller than the electron radius. And then we're substituting to find a force that um, has the area of capacitor uh, being S and dependent directly on it, and also the mass density of uh, the dielectric, and also has atomic number dependence. So he's got an interesting equation, times voltage over time, um, and it may or may not be uh, applicable in most uh, experiments that we come across. But here we go with the experimental results that he's got. And he's using an insulator, uh, oil is the insulator with a plastic disc on top, um, metal vessel, high voltage generator, uh, electric balance. He's got thin copper as the conductor. And he's got some parameters about the uh, weight and diameters. He's using almost 20,000 volts. And he tries to see if there is any difference between the positive or negative uh, voltage. And to be honest, I'm not sure if I see a great difference here between the two of them. Positive voltage data is on the top with eight different trials and the negative voltage on the bottom uh, with eight different trials. And we're basically talking about a fraction of a gram on the y-axis. So the weight loss is uh, very small and, and possibly uh, debatable. But 
we basically uh, give him credit for all this work he put in. And, um, and essentially he's come up with about um, the measured and theoretical to be very close and perhaps um, uh, within the same ballpark uh, since the ratio is near one. And the coefficient can be expressed, coefficient of the dielectric can be expressed uh, with weight loss over weight of capacitor. So that's a new insight that I haven't seen before. And, uh, perhaps that might be useful for further uh, investigations. And so we have a summary of the um, results that he's reporting. And Moosh is talking about for a mass of 100 gram kilograms and a dielectric constant of only five, that he's claiming he's got a force of 100 newtons or 22 pounds. Um, that's pretty incredible. Uh, and, and of course, the electric field is, is pretty high as well, 700 megavolts per meter. So he's uh, explaining that water could be used as well, which has a little bit higher dielectric than what he was using as well uh, before that. And he cites and references um, some work by another uh, Japanese um, contributor, which was uh, a state presentation on some field propulsion methods uh, from general relativity. So that may be worth uh, looking into as well. So moving on to another um, uh, contribution and viewpoint of electrogravitics, I was at a National Space Society uh, local chapter meeting years ago in 2006. And uh, I was on a panel discussion with Bob Zubrin, who you might know from NASA. And I was sitting right next to him, so it was kind of nice. I felt um, in, in, uh, interested in what he had to say. I've always been intrigued by his Mars Direct approach. He's got a book out on, you know, going to Mars and living off the land. <laughs> that, was, that was his original contribution to the trip to Mars. And even today, I think he's influenced the uh, Mars uh, philosophy and, and plan so far. So what I experienced, though, was a kind of an ironic situation. The night before, I had talked to a military contractor. And to this day, I could kick myself for not getting his name and phone number and you know, information and so forth. But he had enough budget to play around with um, electrokinetics and high voltage um, levitation. And he explained what he had done. He basically, um, and, and oh, I didn't tell you the whole story here. Okay, I'm sitting at the panel discussion and Bob Zubrin objected to my talking about electrogravitics. I just started describing some of the experiments that now we've covered. And, and he didn't think it was scientific enough to be included in the panel discussion. So what I did was I asked Joe, I could call him the military contractor. Um, Joe, could you stand up and tell me what you told me last night? And, and he stands up and he says, I levitated a hockey puck. And Zubrin went completely silent. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, this is on video. I actually got the video afterwards. I was so pleased um, because literally he had used the same um, design of Townsend Brown, applied the kilovolts of voltage and levitated this thing he called the hockey puck, proved that it worked. He even blew one up, he said, because he applied too much voltage to it. And, um, and, and, and here Zubrin had no information, no idea of this at all, but he was prejudiced and biased against it. So when, when this um, military contractor spoke, um, uh, basically he quieted up pretty quick. And, and notice once again, pulse current was used and it was an asymmetric uh, electrode placement as well. So I was pleased to have eyewitness accounts for some of these unusual findings and, and surprises. Now, one other insight that I've obtained from the Jeff Menko uh, equation is the Pipkladinov capacitor array. The uh, reports are basically obtainable, I believe still online these are the references for them, the 020-9051 and the 010-8005. Uh, in the archives.org abstract of the physics. So basically the important part I found was by Kledinoff, um, who's a professor, describing the fact that as he has a glowing discharge with sparks uh, emanating from the superconducting uh, cathode, toward the anode, uh, it basically propagates up beyond it 
in a collimated beam. And so I found that I could apply the electrokinetic uh, equation to that, where the current direction seemed to be the opposite of the force that was generated, as I point out here, and therefore at least explain how Plugnoff was obtaining this. And of course, he's using half a megavolt, which is pretty impressive in terms of voltage as well. So maybe Plugnoff's um, impulse gravity generator um, may have some promise, uh, even though it's been very controversial uh, until now. And the um, development here uh, in general, I would say, in, in case anyone's doing some research theory so far, is the Graham and Laus in Nature magazine. Um, that talks about the uh, fact that electromagnetic uh, momentum is basically carried by the vacuum. And their experiments uh, with uh, rotating capacitors seem to actually um, verify that. So Graham and Laos is pretty famous for this discovery. Einstein and Laub also deal with magnetic dielectrics. I was able to obtain their articles and then get a translator from the German, and that's in the homophobic handbook, uh, both of their articles in 1908. And also the author of patent uh, talking about force from the high electron current. And then Ning Li also did a little bit of work and publications on uh, electrogravitics, which he calls gravitoelectric and gravitomagnetic forces. And we already mentioned uh, Woodward's negative mass uh, fluctuations. So the recommendations I would make in, in summarizing this uh, research is that asymmetric capacitors with pulse current deserve more attention. And they really seem to have the most potential for satellite maneuvering, perhaps, in addition to maybe inertial pulsion. And also the Woodward experiments, um, if, I, as I told him directly, if he angled them at 45 degrees from the vertical to get the Z cross B Lorentz force effect, and also combining that with the BIVT electric kinetic force, he might improve the results of the experiment. But it, overall, it is a complex experiment and debatable whether moving masses backward and forward uh, is, is actually a, a very viable way to move big things in, in space. And of course, my standard uh, approach and viewpoint is that we really should be lobbying the military for declassification of energy and propulsion technology. That would happen faster than the average 50 years. When I worked at the patent office, I found that uh, the, um, it's called FAS.org, the Federation of American Scientists um, at FAS.org report every single year the 5,000 patents that are in the vault. And they've been classified by at least one military agency that somehow makes their decision. And I used to see the forums across my desk where they just simply check off their interest. And then all of a sudden, if they decide to withhold it, then essentially I would lose that patent to go across the street to the um, place where people had uh, top secret clearances to examine these things. And then once the patent was fully examined, it would go in the vault. The inventor never received any compensation whatsoever. And when it declassified 50 years later, many of them had already passed on. So this is a real problem for um, the past 70 years, ever since 1950. We've seen classification of advanced energy and propulsion which essentially explains why we're still driving around in World War II cars. <clears throat> now, there's a story that Boeing actually told me through the Department of Energy rep that I mentioned previously, uh, who lives in the area. And he described to me one story that he had uh, when he was working with Boeing directly. And they had developed uh, a new laminar flow, which may have been similar to the high voltage uh, effect that we saw with the Air Force Research Lab later on. Uh, but essentially, their, their development was classified. And even when they applied to the Air Force, which was their customer, for permission to use it on civilian aircraft, it was denied. Go figure. You know, the, the, who would ever apply to your customer for permission to use the invention you've just invented? But that's what happens with the military, uh, where they're controlling all the first strings. <clears throat> so um, overall, the 
first volume, Electrovitic Systems, is still in print, selling really well, even 25, 27 years later. And the Aviation Studies reports, the Bonson Patents, the uh, Asymmetric Capacitors, even some of his diary is included in that. Uh, second volume includes the AFL report, the Honda Lab report, biographies, and the McCamish report, which I'm just going to finish up in the conclusion right now with. And this is the McCamish contribution to the second volume. Mark McCamish uh, is a great uh, aerospace uh, illustrator. He drew this entire um, diagram you're looking at uh, from eyewitness accounts. And this was uh, witnessed to be levitating at Norton Air Force Base in 1988. And it seems to obey the pulsed electrokinetic effect on parallel plate, plate capacitors. And these are alternately uh, fired with high voltage in a, in a triangular, I would say a triad. In other words, three of the plates sections are fired. They move on to the next one circularly, firing those three with high voltage and going around the circle. So there's a constant force downward. And this obeys the same electrokinetic equation that I described earlier with pulsed operation. And what was interesting is that uh, it was seen by a fellow named Brad Sorensen, who was a personal friend of Mark McCamish, and also a congressman uh, in a hangar behind um, uh, basically a closed um, draped area. And they essentially saw three of these crafts levitating with 1950s rivets, he said, uh, as, as some of this uh, artwork shows you. And, uh, and yet it still had plenty of force to, to levitate it. So when I contacted Hal Putoff, who had also done some due diligence on this story, uh, Hal, in a private email, described to me in 2006, he says, I was able to independently interview the source of the story, verify indeed he did tell the story to an individual, passed it on to me, and number two, independently interview yet another source who had heard the similar story, but he yeah, was then never able to verify the story itself was true only that there were two individuals who said it was true. <laughs> so Al Putoff's um, very cagey uh, conclusion was, the story remains in my gray basket as only possibly true. <laughs> so there you have it. Um, essentially, that's the end of the electrolytic story. It's possibly true. So thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I guess we still have time for answering them. Well, Tom, thank you. Thank you very much. So let me do this. First thing, I want to put this on gallery view. Let me let me stop your screen share. Okay. And let me see. Perfect. And everybody, please put your hands together. Thank you. Thank you.